This podcast is part two in a three-part series on rethinking culture in the context of civil-military relations. But one of the ways that the militaries, uh, our military organizations attempted to, to uh, win hearts and minds was to do what I'll call development or quasi-humanitarian uh, projects. They've gone by a variety of names. Right. They started off being called quick impact projects uh, and, and so infrastructure on. Infrastructure projects, projects, schools, roads. Yeah. And these actually are a significant history in themselves right. that's rarely told, I think, in the academy and certainly not in the right. mainstream news. Right. right? We don't hear about the level of investment and the attempt on the part of the military to use local contractors, right. for instance, for Afghanistan and Iraq. Right and the infrastructure that was built to varying degrees of yeah. effectivity given local contractors. But this was part of the story of, if we want to put this in a kind of... More complex sort of... Yeah, more complex more, for sure, but also maybe the wins or the positives on the part of the military yeah. approach to yeah. culture and humanitarian issues, yeah. and then think about the other side of the, the, um, the divide, the humanitarian yeah. approach to some of these issues. Yeah. This would be on the win side for the military, for sure. So, so no doubt, uh, bringing uh, potable water, for example, exactly. to to, uh, to a village, c creating schools, these these would be wins. The question uh, from a uh, from a humanitarian perspective uh, is twofold. There are two questions. One is how sustainable were these? Um, they may have, in some cases, uh, used local contractors. Uh, created uh, infrastructure that couldn't be maintained because the local resources weren't there. They may have, they may have provided uh, resources that, from our Western perspective, we think are priorities. Uh, priorities that, from local perspective, are not. So that's that's the first. Yeah. The second is that uh, the uh, these projects began to identify in the minds of local populations humanitarian workers with uh, with the military. military. And that then, f in a, sort of in a critical view, uh, diminished the humanitarian space uh, that, that was available to, uh, to protect humanitarian workers. And made humanitarian workers, in many cases, targets in ways that exactly. they hadn't felt like they were targets before. Exactly. And, and there's been an increase in, in attacks uh, on, uh, on humanitarian workers uh, right. around the world. So, so, that was, so this um, part of the cultural turn involved trying to uh, get organizational cultures uh, to collaborate uh, better. Part, uh, part of it uh, involved trying on the part of, uh, for example, military organizations to use uh, the, the forms of, of humanitarian and development assistance uh, as part of it, as a force multiplier. Right. So, yeah. And I think if we think about um, positives on each side Sorry, of the, of the you know kind of military um, civil um, relationship, especially in the context of the post 9/11 wars, mm -hmm. I think we can say a couple of things about sure. positives and negatives. Absolutely. I mean, so on the military side, you know, we mentioned that even the endeavor to consider culture when your usual framework of security is, is you know, a potential positive, right? You're, you're trying to actually integrate security um, guarantees at a more durable and a more integrated level. Right. And the hope would be, at least, that those would pan out long term for pe peace and stability, right? I mean, that's the, that's the real uh, advantage of that kind of approach, mm -hmm. keeping in mind the, all the complexities and the, and the blowback and the backlash mm -hmm. and the negatives we've already talked about. So that's, that's one on the military side. Two would be that this emphasis on hearts and minds was backed up by civil infrastructure programs mm -hmm. that, you know, with the generosity of, you know, the American taxpayer, right? I mean, we have um, the special inspector general reports for both Afghanistan and Iraq that show that you know, uh, multiple billions of dollars were spent, and in many cases there was you know high corruption, high graft on the part of local contractors and local populations, such that this kind of idealistic effort to try to rebuild societies was not necessarily successfully executed, in part because of local partners, sure. the deficits of local partners. 
And I, I think so, the, so, so it's yeah. really, it's, it's, it's important to say, I think, a couple yeah. of things to, to nuance that yeah. a, a little <laughs> bit. Uh, we, 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 ha we come and We from always go back and forth. forth. We have a slightly different views yeah. on, uh, on the success of this. The, um, yes, there's no question that the effort to understand culture has the potential to change the way that uh, military organizations think about uh, what their next step should be. Right. Uh, that can be a broadening thing. That effort, though, is, um, is somewhat beggared by two things within the organizational cultures of our military. One is that folks uh, rotate uh, through their assignments fairly quickly. So just right. as they're getting up to speed, so just the as the individual level of cultural, cultural knowledge, knowledge was severely it, it, limited. Right. They, they move on and, and new relationships have to form, yeah. gets done over and over again, recreated right. because of the rotation. The second is that the, uh, the incentives for uh, things like uh, promotion uh, are Very misaligned with, with, a, uh, with, a, um, with, with individuals who wish to pursue that kind of cultural understanding as a strategic right. uh, element. Uh, so this so. is inside the military hierarchy. Uh, yes. So if you're a commander and you're winning wars, you're in a promotable kind of situation. Mm -hmm. If you're a linguist who's doing cultural engagement, mm -hmm. you don't have the same prospects for promotion right. up the ladder in, right. inside and, of the military. And, and that then it serves as a disincentive right. to, to take uh, culture seriously. As well, it, it, culture has to compete uh, for, for, with other training priorities right. uh, so often it is uh, given very short uh, from a from an from a cultural anthropological yeah. perspective it's given very short amounts of time that would be effective in teaching only the most what I call the most basic level of cultural engagement which is how to avoid making make, making faux pas that, that insult people I call right. that traveler's advice mm -hmm. uh, which is great it's but it's very rote Right. Uh, and it doesn't provide the constraints on training, uh, often don't provide the opportunity to get more in depth, to understand the generative uh, reasons that, that people do things about why you wouldn't do particular, say, make particular gestures or, or, or right. approach particular individuals in the community. So there are those organizational constraints that, that work against the good intentions of, of cultural training. And the good intentions and idealism of the, of the military also had some um, unintended consequences. So at times, the military trying to show too much respect for culture right. inside of Afghanistan right. or Iraq would ignore human rights abuses. Exactly. So, and in some ways reify, so stabilize those parts of Afghan society or Iraqi society that were um, against their own constitutional norms or against their own human rights norms. And we can talk about abuse of children, um, you know, gender discrimination, uh, race, race and ethnic minority discrimination, even attacks against uh, religious minority populations. So sometimes out of an overdue respect for a kind of idealized notion of culture, that somehow you always have to be respectful of culture no matter what is in the box of culture, the military would be in the situation of reifying or stabilizing or authorizing or validating cultural practices that were certainly against US constitutional rights, but against international human rights mm -hmm. and were um, factors that would lead to more protracted conflict inside these societies. So this is, a re this is really, really interesting and important, and there is uh, a way to speak about this from an anthropological perspective that, <laughs> I, that I think is important. One of the contributions of, of uh, being exposed to, to different cultures, to understanding that people around the world organize themselves in many, many different ways, conceive of the world in many different ways, uh, is to understand, is, is to take an approach that says in order to understand them, one has to respect them. And in anthropology, this is called cultural relativism, right. where, we, uh, where we say, okay, if you want to understand a practice, you need to understand it relative to uh, the culture uh, in which has produced it. Now, that is an intellectual and conceptual and analytic uh, framework. Uh, not a normative Not a normative one, one. and it's often, and it's often mistaken, Confused. it's often mistaken as, uh, as in exactly the way that that, you're, that we have to accept whatever it is. No, we just have to understand it, right. uh, but then we can move on to make evaluative statements. So 
uh, I'll say that, the, and, and I think that this is a good, uh, a, a good example of the kind of uh, challenge that the lack of depth of yeah. engagement with culture uh, oh, pr promotes because it sees it as oh well, we have to uh, we have to just automatically, automatically validate accept everything. Yes. anything that's going on right. even abuse them. so we call this in our future research this is a subject of future research between Robert and I mm. we call it the abuse of culture yeah. thesis yeah. so so so, uh, so this so this is important that 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 to know that you know just understanding culturally doesn't mean that you have to agree with folk what people do and. Part of the engagement in funding local contractors and 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 so on uh, depends on um, understanding the cultural arrangements and who's getting those. So we may be reproducing power uh, structures, power structures that are that are wrong. And this is a great case to focus just for a second on because what often occurred, especially in the context of Afghanistan but also Iraq, was this kind of shadow government that was created. So because, and there were lots of reasons that the U.S. was trying to do this, I mean, especially in terms of heart, trying to win hearts and minds, nice. trying to batter back a counterinsurgency that was, that was pretty well entrenched. We often would give money to local authorities in a highly attenuated, non-centralized governmental system in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So in the process of doing that, what we would do unwittingly, even though we were trying to help and trying to, you know, build at the very local grassroots, roots. culturally grassroots yeah, level, we were trying to build capacity. Oftentimes what we would do is create um, shadow government where local warlords would be empowered oh. to essentially um, create even more stringent power structures in their local yeah. communities. And this, this happened again for multi-determinants, but the kind of one piece we're focusing on is, is the role of cultural thinking mm -hmm. that helped make those decisions. And in the process, what you could do is, is in a way, um, disempower federal government, central government mm -hmm. that you were trying to build capacity in. That was the case in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. In the case of Iraq, what you were unwittingly doing was building kind of Madisonian factions that would compete with each other in ways that were very, very virulent, could be sources of long-standing okay. conflict that would destabilize whole uh, provinces and regions. So what you're describing is sort of a, a, the, a, a fact we're addressing a local problem, a, an immediate problem in front of a, a unit's uh, eyes, worked against the larger strategic issue. Effort. There is a relationship between the larger strategic goals and the tactical a activities that exactly. goes up and down and, and what we've called a scaffolding effect uh, before. Uh, so it's really important. Uh, and one of the things about uh, culture is it's not just enough to, to say, okay, folks at the general staff, they really have to understand culture deeply. But the folks at the pointy end of the spear, they just need to know a little bit because they, this interacts up and down the, the uh, strategic uh, hierarchy. Right. So. so it needs to be part of grand strategic design, mm. operational design. Okay. The difficulty in trying to build a, a, a valued relationship mm. between culture and security in every, any given mission, I mean, there are many difficulties, but one obvious difficulty is as you're pointing out, who has the cultural knowledge, knowledge who can actually integrate and in, in, into the design process this, you know, in an actual field operation. Mm -hmm. um, but there are, there are other problems as well. I mean, some we've already mentioned. One is that the cultural needs of any g given situation shift pretty rapidly. Right. So you need pretty direct feedback loops. And is it reasonable to expect a military force, you know, that's trying to bring peace and stability. Is it reasonable for us to expect that the kind of cultural proficiency can be that of a anthropology PhD sure. or a cultural studies PhD? Very difficult to assume, I think. Uh, of course. Um.